This destroyed, conference will now be recorded. Destroyed sinuses, post-surgical changes, entrectomies, all that horrible stuff, chronic disease, ugly. Um, and here we usually see these in the setting of CF patients, so on and so forth. Here's a study that was done just the other, where is it? Here, my Lord. Here's a study we just did the other day on this woman. I think that sinus CT was from like a year or two ago. And so we usually do this on CFers, but there's bronchiectasis, but it's not in the right distribution for CF. Uh, it's lower, low predominant. And so then the other things, it involves all five lobes, but really the tree and bud nodularity and the mucus plugging is worse in the lower lobes. And then you start thinking about ciliary dyskinesia, but she doesn't have that. And we can go back to uh, 2009 and see that she has had similar, I don't know how people read things on five millimeter slices. It's funny, I go back to these studies, I'm like, how do, I, don't, I just don't get it. But anyways, you can see that this patient has had some form of findings of what looks like chronic infection. Again, NTM, it's weird to be lower low, but some sort of chronic bronchiolitis, I'll put it that way. And this is a case of um, pan-bronchiolitis. So this is uh, biopsy-proven pan-bronchiolitis. Um, you know, there's no, patient didn't have any ciliary dyskinesia or anything like that. She was a young woman who was of, who was of Asian descent. So we see a fair decent amount here. And the pan-bronchiolitis cases, even though it is called pan-bronchiolitis, it, it really isn't, diff I mean, it's all over the place, but it's not like just literally as diffuse as you would think given the name. But pathologically, I guess it is distinguishable from other causes of bronchiolitis. I'm not really sure how. So we see, again, a decent number here. Um, so uh, and, Seth, was there, was there any organism associated with her bronchial disease did was she colonized with something or other she was colonized with things but at times she was and other times she wasn't so i'm sure she was chronically infected um they do bronx on her like every couple weeks not every couple weeks every couple months and they treat her okay. but i don't think i have to check she she has had um aspergillus other things but mm -hmm. a lot of times she is not infected via bronch, but that doesn't mean anything. But I have to say, if you look at the distribution of disease between 2023, and I know that doesn't mean anything, and 2009, it is strikingly similar and not, it's a little, it is worse, but it's um, very similar, right middle lobe, lower lobes. It, it's not, it, it's not as fluctuating as you see with a lot of cases of NTM where it gets better and worse, it's kind of been the slowly progressive. So I don't know if that helps at all. But, um, but no particular organisms go with this diffuse panbronchiolitis airways disease, is that correct? I don't know enough about okay. it. You guys probably know more than I do. Um, no, but they usually will stabilize with macrolide therapy or at least it can help to slow the progression. So this is a patient with, I think most of us would look at this and not the nodules. Uh, well, the nodules help with the diagnosis a little bit, little, some peribronchovascular nodules, some air bronchograms. But um, this is, to me, emphysema, dilated air spaces with... Uh, kind of central dots in them, some ground glass. Patient is an older woman, never smoker. Um, and we have a, also a bunch of these cases. And unfortunately, we don't really have pathology on any of that. Lynch was nicely showing during our weekly case conference. Again, I, I think most of us would call these areas of emphysema. Um, again, other nodules, peribronchovascular, that kind of wax and wane over time. Uh, and she has a, uh, and, and the areas of emphysema are in some ways peribronchovascular, their lower lobe, and it's hard to tell. But anyways, this is a uh, patient has an anca uh, vasculitis, and we've seen, he's shown at least a, a fair number of cases of non-smokers. You can see as it, the 
areas of emphysema kind of line the uh, peribronchial vascular interstitium. I wish I had thinner slices, but you can see it out here in the right lower lobe, uh, lateral segment, anterior segment, so on and so forth. Um, and we've seen a couple cases of positive vasculitis kind of presenting with these areas of emphysema, which I don't know if it's due to the hemorrhage, um, if it's due to some other aspect as well. Um, ha have you guys seen that before? She was not a smoker, right? Never smoker, never touched a cigarette in her life. Um, and uh, we have about six or seven cases exactly like this. Unfortunately, again, um, all ANCA positive or MPO positive, um, never smokers, <coughs> lower lobe emphysema in a peribronchovascular distribution. But again, we just don't have pathology on any of it. So it's hard to write it up. It'd be interesting. Um, mm, no, I don't think I have. Yeah, he was showing a bunch of cases. There. It was really interesting. I hadn't seen one when I first got here. And then he, we talked about it. And here's another similar but different. So this is kind of really striking. I don't know if you want to call it emphysema. I don't know what to call this. I, I wouldn't call it emphysema here. You could just see lucency along the peribronchovascular interstitium here. Literally, as the airways and vessels go out, it's just a clearing. Um, also a never smoker. I have a, a third case of this that uh, I was going to show. So this one has some septal thickening, and he had undergone an open lung biopsy. And I'll just go another case, go back earlier on him. Here's 2012. So you can see that this has been here for many years. Um, the septal thickening was progressive, but this kind of lucency it's really hard to see it. it. It's you can see it's there. It's just hard to tell. And some areas that again would be considered emphysema, maybe septal thickening. Um, this guy was labeled as idiopathic pulmonary hemosiderosis. I, I don't know if that's really a diagnosis. I mean, he basically underwent a, a biopsy which showed um, just extensive hemosiderin hemosiderin laden macrophages filling all of his alveoli. So, so some sort of chronic recurrent hemorrhage. Um, mm. and we have also seen cases of this here, of this kind of lucency around the interstitium there in people with chronic hemorrhage. Again, this is something I would, I never previously put in my differential, but, um, also a never smoker, but this is something that here they're like, oh yeah, we see this. And I'm like, okay. Um, so the septal thickening, again, that's a good thing for chronic recurrent hemorrhage. Uh, but he has no known vasculitis per se, like none of his, you know, he doesn't have a vasculitis that's been worked up or proven. So, and the biopsy didn't show any sign of vasculitis, just hemorrhage. It's just kind of a very pretty pattern. Um, and I don't have much else to add. Just things that I not really have experience with that I'm learning to now add to my differential. <laughs> All right, those those are my cases. Cool. Have you guys seen this before? I mean, no, I, no. Okay, because I, I don't no. know if you guys are. Like, oh yeah, we see this all the time. Or I, I just never. <laughs> uh, I think I've I seen mean, like cysts in chronic hemorrhage and recurrent hemorrhage, but yes. never this like along the. Yes, and the last one yeah. was so. So the last one we like cysts, emphysema, something. We have definitely cases like that. <clears throat> yeah. Um, but anyways, and you could say like, okay, here's a little cyst or but whatever. Okay, that's it. All righty, who's up? I can I show can go. some of it. Yeah, Travis, you get, you get priority. I'll probably just show like three if you have some and Jeff has some as well. All right, are you seeing my screen? Good. Yeah, yep. my database screen, okay. So Howard, this one is for you. And this is also just a general question if anybody has seen anything like this. 
So this is a female who came in with a spontaneous pneumothorax, and she's done this a few times. This is at outside. These are outside hospitals a few years ago. CT at the outside hospital three years ago, and you can see there are these are two and a half millimeter slice thickness, but there are some discrete thin walled cysts, and they do have walls. And the usual suspects are not there. She doesn't have any AMLs, other renal neoplasms. She had a workup for lamb that was negative. <laughs> it was negative. You know, she does not have tuber sclerosis. She doesn't have a known malignancy. And she even got a surgical lung biopsy at the outside and a pleurodesis, as you can see. When they took the lung out, they just said, we don't know what this is, cystic disease, NOS. Uh, and then she came to us, you can see this is 2022, similar deal You can see where she had her pleurodesis and, and surgical lung biopsy on the right. So then she comes to us, and this was back in the summer, and she again comes in with a spontaneous pneumothorax. At this time, she has a few more cysts, and they also notice that she started to develop, there's a few nodules, tiny little guys that are scattered around in the lower lobes here. You know, there's a few others that, you know, small, uh, but still unexplained. So they ended up doing a full chest and pelvis CT, thinking, does she have some unknown malignancy, whatnot? If she's not a smoker. Yeah, no history of endometriosis, and they didn't see anything like that on the uh, on the on the biopsy. So, no malignancy. Then the the pulmonologist came down to ask me, "What do I think?" And you know, I was just scrolling through, and I, was, and I just happened to peek at the abdomen and pelvis CT because I was curious. And when there's no explanation, I think it's always good practice. And we saw this here. And I was like, oh, that's kind of funny. Looks like she's had some prior silicone injections or something's gone wrong. There's a lot of calcification mm -hmm. here. And some of these areas look like maybe silic like the little fat globules you see with silicone. And long story short, the pulmonary team then went and talked to her. And she had had prior cosmetic, uh, you know, not... Um, I guess what back alley cosmetic, like not licensed, just free silicone injection into her gluteal regions like 20 years ago. And I said, well, you know, that can embolize to the lungs. And we've seen chronic cases where it just deposits in the lungs. I have no idea if that could be causing the nodules and the cysts, but can you get the path? And they were able to get the path and reviewed it from the outside hospital. I think in here you can see little globules. And I, they weren't completely biased by what I had told them, but this is what they found. And when you were talking about the granulomas, Howard, you know, they were talking about oh, on your cyst case, this giant cell reaction in lipogranulomas is what was seen. And this is kind of why they, they, but they didn't think to look for anything that had potentially embolized. And you can read the comment of our pathologist that they have these, diffuse embolization of a lipid-based material with these clear empty round spaces and they think it was just removed with the fixation and so mm -hmm. this is being treated as a presumptive case of chronic symbol silicone embolization with cysts which is this a manifestation i have not seen and nope. we're either one write this up um, because you know there we've shown cases of chronic and acute silicone embolization but nothing that has looked like this so Gosh, no. thoughts. I mean, it, it makes sense that you get something in the lung that that causes this granulomatous reaction that that causes the cyst to form. So on path there were granulomas, Howard. right? What's that? Granulomas were present on path. Lipogranulomas. Lipogranulomas. Okay, got it. <laughs> yeah, whatever that means. Uh, but. You know, she had the, the million dollar cyst work up and there was nothing else. So, well, it's attractive. You I think say that's well, got to be what know, it is. Pages are there, the histiocytes are there, they're reacting to the presence of the silicone, and then they decide to upregulate your matrix metalloproteinosis. Of course, I'm yeah. speculating, but it's kind of attractive. It's kind of 
idea, I suppose. Oh. Yeah, we don't have a better explanation. Yeah, we should we should throw Riddle and Lung into this uh, into this discussion too. Because that's another situation in which there's this uh, excipient deposit in the lung, the talc. Macrophages sure. go to work trying to clear that, and they end up digesting the lung away, and it's in an embolic, you know, basal distribution. So, anytime you get foreign material in the lung, and you you tell those histiocytes to go to work, you're yeah. putting your lung at risk. Yeah, it's an attractive some pay idea. Yeah, I mean, we've it's been discussed, and it's kind of the prevailing theory here, and everybody's in agreement at at our institution. Um, so this is uh, you know, quite the trauma case, and you know I think this patient is not really rotated. This has all of the hallmark findings of traumatic aortic injury. The trachea is pushed halfway into the right hemithorax. <laughs> You've lost the aortic arch. The left main stem bronchus is depressed. You know, there's no discernible anatomy here other than what you presume is a huge hematoma. In the, in the mediastinum, and also probably a hemothorax. The interesting thing in this case, too, is that this patient ends up with a combo because their stomach bubble is a little bit higher than on the right, than the diaphragm on the right side. Yeah. And you'll see on this, and they had a second chest radiograph, so they placed a chest tube before they went to the CT scanner. You can see it's even higher now. Um, I don't know if there's any other findings. Obviously, I'm leading people towards both traumatic aortic injury and a diaphragmatic rupture. I don't know if there's any other findings one would, would suggest or, or point out that suggests there's a diaphragmatic rupture here. Or if that's too hard to call on this radiograph just in with everything else going on. Well, the fact it's elevated is disturbing. Yeah. Yeah, and almost focally elevated, sort of. Yeah. Yeah, so let's see if I can. So there's his traumatic aortic injury. So his, he's transected his proximal descending thoracic aorta, just distal to the ligamentum. And no surprise, there's the hematoma. And I think actually the, I wonder if the diaphragm being injured also is kind of displacing the mediastinum right and, and was contributing to some of that. It's not the, the largest hematoma we've ever seen, but it there is a pretty significant hematoma. And then sure enough, here's the diaphragm let me make an MPR here to see it a little bit easier. Um, see if we can blow well, that's this a big up. Ring, isn't it? You can you can see the waste right there with the colon coming through. All right, it's a fairly sizable defect, but all the findings there's dependent viscera. The spleen didn't make it through. The stomach and the colon did, uh, but he was fortunately able to go to Surgery for the diaphragm, stent for his descending thoracic aorta has been discharged. So, you know, it's a pretty remarkable uh, recovery. Yeah. That's great. So just in terms of terminology, the diaphragm wasn't elevated. The uh, stomach was <laughs> elevated through the diaphragm. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you're exactly right. Okay. Um, yeah. Without cheating off the thumbnails, what do you guys think about this radiograph? Um, let's see. I'm looking at the uh, left hilar pulmonary artery, trying to decide if it's potentially abnormal. Um, it PAs vascular distension, cephalization, big low yeah. atrium at B. Um, and so I would think some sort of shunt in this person. Yeah, exactly. Like, Huge pulmonary arteries, looks like shunt vascularity. And I was reading this, and we already had the outside CT. The, the patient was being referred for surgery, so I thought, oh, this is just going to be ASD repair yeah. or something. But where's the, where's the right and, pulmonary artery? The right pulmonary artery is not very big. It's, it's hiding it's behind here, and that's okay. the other observation here is you have this sneaky convexity right here. And you can see on the thumbnails, that's why I didn't want you to look. But here's the ascending aorta which is over eight centimeters now. And so that was unknown. This guy actually presented to an outside hospital with dyspnea. Who's, he's 49. He had a history of systemic hypertension. That was it. And they rushed him off to us once they found that his, he, he did not dissect, but his aorta was eight centimeters. 
Plus, they saw in the echo that he had a shunt. So he does, in fact, have a shunt. It's interesting because at surgery, they actually called this a premium-like ASD. I was going to say, it looks more... The, yeah, yeah, it does look more premium. I, I agree. Yeah, right there. Right? Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah, that, that's why they called it premium-like in quotes, you know, because there's no full cushion defect. Everything else yeah. was okay. Um, they thought that maybe the tricuspid valve was a little less apically displaced on echo than it typically is, which would also go along with the premum issues. But there was no VSD. The valves themselves were okay. So they were able to patch this and did an ascending, uh, ascending replacement. But I think, you know, yeah, the, it was the, 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 the vessels that jumped out at me first. And then this, again, snuck up on me. Right. And of course there was no lateral. It was just a single P, uh, AP view. It really is impressive how big of an aorta you can hide yep. on a radiograph. Oh yeah. Yep. Oh yeah. Yep. All right. Um, bu- 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 I'll show this one really quick. Uh, this is one where you know, for the trainees on here, don't get biased by what you're told. Uh, this is a, patient who you can see is 15 years old, you know, don't let the history bias you too much because this is a patient who had reportedly swallowed a needle. They actually started with an abdominal radiograph to see where the needle was and there was nothing in the abdomen. And you know, the, the resident looked at this and said, well, it's kind of lateral, but I guess it could be in the esophagus if they have a dilated esophagus. And no, it's not in the esophagus. They didn't swallow it. They actually aspirated this. And that's where you have to, you know, it comes with experience, but certainly with this angulation on the lateral view, you know, of course it superimposes over the expected location of the foregut on the lateral view, but this is just way too lateral in somebody who is otherwise normal to be in the esophagus. Um, so this was, this was in the airway. They were able to retrieve it, but I, th- I think it's a sewing needle. I'm not actually sure. I couldn't really tell if you if I see a head for the the thread to go through, but um, it's a little unusual that it went on the left side, but it happens. And again, I'm not exactly sure how it happened, but it did. So I don't yeah. know if anyone else has any other comments. It's not getting too biased by the history or or getting you know directed towards one yeah. the, you know, and, a specific diagnosis. And it may be also the you know, patient, uh, you know, use the term colloquially, a swallow, I mean, ingested somewhere in the aerodigestive right. tract. Right. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, all right, cool. stop there. All righty. Let's see who do we got left. Uh, David and Maya. I've got a couple. Yeah, I have two, but happy to go whenever. Right. Why don't you go, why don't you go first, Maya? Okay. All right. Mine should be relatively quick. Yeah, we got plenty of time. Perfect. Okay. Um, so this one I thought is kind of a good companion to what Travis showed earlier. Um, this is a case that one of my fellows showed to me. So uh, this radiograph was done on an otherwise healthy outpatient because on physical exam they had diminished lung sounds at the left base, which is understandable. Um, and we can see this, what looks to me like elevation of the hemidiaphragm with this very large stomach bubble underneath. Um, and they decided to do a CT to look at it better, I guess. Um, and, you know, that's exactly what we see, which is that the hemidiaphragm is elevated and the stomach is pushing up. Um, but the cute thing about this, or the nice thing about this, is if we look at that diaphragm, particularly down here, the cruise of the diaphragm as we're coming down, it is very, very thin, especially compared to the other side. So suggestive of probably, I would suspect, chronic paralysis of that hemidiaphragm, right? We can see how thin that is compared to the other side. And I feel like we do occasionally do CTs to look for potentially an underlying cause of um, paralysis or chronic weakness in the diaphragm. And frequently I feel like I don't find a whole lot or I don't find a specific cause. But in this case, um, we can see this big calcified granuloma, which is almost sort of tethering the mediastinum here. And I suspect that may be affecting the phrenic nerve as it courses down the mediastinum. And this patient did have a remote history of treated TB, which is probably what this is from. 
And so I suspect that's what originally caused their nerve neurologic issue causing this chronic paralysis. Wow. I just feel like, I don't know if other people have a better track record of actually finding the cause, but this was one of the few ones that I have seen that actually has. No, usually not. Yeah. Yeah. About 50% of the time the cause of paralysis is not known. Okay. That's good to know. It's not just me. Great. And then the other one that I have is um, just an unusual variant. So here on the scout, I unfortunately don't have a radiograph. This is the closest um, I've got. It does look like there's a little bit of increased density down here, overlapping with the left hemidiaphragm. And if we come to the CT on lung windows, we can see this little area of lung, um, which if we look closely, we can see has arterial supply directly from the aorta right, coming up here. It's a nice little sequestration, but the interesting thing to me was the venous supply, which is this, crosses across the posterior mediastinum and goes to the opposite um, hemithorax before joining with the atrium. So this is a pulmonary sequestration, but That's it's a got, new one. yeah, I've, I'd never seen one where the vascular supply was coming from the other side. Never. And, yeah, one of my colleagues called this a horseshoe lung. I don't know if that's... Oh, barf. Nope. Please don't call yeah, it a horseshoe nope. lung. Okay. Yeah, I did no, not. I just had this sequestration with <laughs> venous... It's, it's a meandering yeah. sequestered vein. Right. Yeah. That's weird. But yeah, it was just a very unusual and obviously... Is there is an inferior vein on the left? Um, a very small one. Oh, on the left. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there it is. Oh, so it's got that common posterior uh, um, antrum there where they come together yes. midline. Yes. So maybe, it, yeah, so it, there was it, the sequestration, whatever came from whatever what was available. And it must have been the other side when it, yeah. it was all one big blob of cells. Interesting. That is really cool. I've never seen anything like that. Yeah. I've never no, seen I anything like that. I, I'm um, pretty sure this cannot happen. <laughs> right that was kind of my thought is like, I'm like i don't understand how this is happening but um yeah this That's was great. also i have to i have to give a shout out to our abdominal colleagues who were actually the ones who called this originally back several years ago uh, when they saw it on an abdominal ct that's great but they didn't share it with us then they didn't share it with us then <laughs> we're a little upset about that so anyways those are my cases all right thank you Mike. yeah of course all right david Okay, can people see a radiograph here with bilateral pleural effusion? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so this man has uh, CML. This was uh, from 2019, and he's had this, it's a chronic CML, a very chronic CML, and he was being treated with uh, dasatinib, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that's used for CML. And that one of the side effects of that is pleural effusion, which Pleural effusion can be large. So about 28% of people on des desatinib will get pleural effusions. And here's what it looks like um, on CT. It's really good size, right greater than left. So these large pleural effusions, you think of something really dire, like you know malignancy in the mediastinum, like lymphadenopathy or lymphoma uh, could do this. You know, I thought first that this has got to be hepatic hydrothorax just because of the size, but there was no ascites to connect it to. And this is just desatinib. When desatinib was discontinued and his chemotherapy was switched to another agent, this went away. So this is a known complication. I've seen it before, but this is dramatic in terms of the volume of the pleural effusion. There's also pericardial effusion that can be part of this too. So I've seen this before in our bone marrow transplant service, but I've not seen it of this magnitude. Is this familiar to you guys? Travis has showed a case well, in the past. I had one a few years ago, and it was it was a chylus effusion. So I was going to ask if they yeah. tapped it and and if it was chylus. This was not chylus, uh, but I when I you know I looked this up a little bit, and uh, it, chylus effusion is 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 reported in this condition, but it doesn't have to be chylus. And as far as I know, the previous cases I'd seen were not chylus. This one was not. 
okay? Okay, um, can you see a fresh radiograph, one hopes, with an upper mediastinal mass? Indeed. Yes. Okay. So um, this, this woman came in because of uh, fever and cough, and she does have pneumonia. Uh, this pneumonia has been treated for a few weeks and stuff like that. But then she has this rather surprising upper mediastinum. And it turns out that's not all. So here's what CT looks like on her. Um, she has this big anterior neck mass, oh. and this stuff goes down, continues down into the mediastinum. So we've got mediastinal stuff too, and we even have axillary stuff here, particularly on the right, but a small amount even on the left. So um, she carries a diagnosis. <laughs> the, the, the name of this diagnosis keeps changing. She's just moved to this area, so we don't have a long track record with her, but she, she's sometimes called cystic hygroma. She's had lesions since childhood um, up in the neck here and um, chest wall. And other people are calling this Gorham stout disease, which is vanishing bone, but she doesn't have bone involvement, so that doesn't seem like appropriate terminology. Let me show you her, um, her neck study here. Um, so she's got quite a bit of stuff in her neck, particularly the left. Now, cystic hygroma is often predominantly on the left and sort of between the, uh, the, the head, the neck and the, and the shoulder. So she does have that predominance. And then here's this big shoulder component here, and that becomes anterior chest wall component, and then going down into mediastinum. So this is all lymphangioma. And what to call it, whether you're going to call it Gorham Stout disease or cystic hygroma, which term I think is, is going away. It, it, the underlying pathology here is uh, lymphangioma. So a rather dramatic case. I don't think I've ever seen anything this massive in the way of um, yeah. lymphatic malformation. Yeah, so I think the current terminology is lymphatic malformation or something like that. Comments? Yeah. Lymphatic venous malformation. Yeah. Something along this, like a spectrum. Is now, I is it Turner's syndrome that this is associated yeah, with? That's right. It is associated with Turner's, and there's some other uh, syndromes besides Turner's. Depending on if you pick this up during pregnancy, then it's it's more likely to be associated with Turner's. If you pick it up, on, say on a fetal ultrasound and stuff. So um, she didn't have any flebolis to suggest that there was a venous component to this. Um, but she has now been referred to our children's hospital, even though she's in her 20s. And they will have the expertise to give us a more refined diagnosis because the terminology has been bouncing around in the naive medical records that have been compiled so far here. Okay, so we thought that one was abnormal. And um, wow. then I just wanted to show you this uh, acute case of congenital heart disease. This person has pediatric Cernoma wires in place here. So this is complex congenital heart disease. The aortic arch is on the right, deviating the trachea. Uh, the apex of the heart is on the left. The stomach, you can't really tell, but it turns out it's on the left. Um, but I was scrolling through CT on this case. And um, what interested me was the, the bronchial arrangement here, because this woman has um, right lung isomerism. So she has a left upper lobe bronchus. Her uh, pulmonary artery does not go over the bronchus. So it's imitating the right, doesn't go over the bronchus. And then she gets a bronchus intermedius and then a middle lobe branch and a lower lobe branch down here. And on, so she has bilateral right-sidedness to her lungs. Let's go on down to the abdomen. Uh, she's had some sort of uh, repair of something here in her heart. I haven't really looked up her heart diagnosis at this point. Her liver extends across the midline, so it's not just confined to the right. It's way over on the left as well. And there's not much of spleen. Maybe this is a little bit of spleen, but it looks like a pretty much an asplenia. The stomach bubble is on the left here. The stomach's on the left. So uh, she does have this, you know, funny isomerism. This is the first case I've seen of right lung isomerism. 
you know, we've seen several incidental cases of left lung isomerism over the years um, you know, without congenital heart disease. This is the first time I've seen right lung isomerism. Have you guys seen that before? No, it's pretty rare. I mean, it's, and it's associated with like severe congenital heart disease, but we've seen plenty of less, even just incidentally. Right. So uh, this is her left lung, and I just want to show you that she has a nice middle lobe here on the left side um, with fissures on top and, and below. We cross to the other side, we see almost the same thing. So um, bilateral right-sidedness here, right lung isomerism, is my first case. Okay, guys, those are, those are the three I wanted to show you. Very cool. All right, I've got a few I can show as well. All right, you guys see a CT scan? Yep. All right, so, all right, so this, I have two cases that are relevant to ones Howard showed. So this is a middle-aged woman who's got cysts in her lungs. She also has some nodules. And you can see some of the cysts are large. A lot of them have vessels running around the edge. Um, so, and, you know, this would be a so-called radiologic LIP pattern of cysts, although we know it's probably not really LIP. Um, but what she had was this, um, let me find it here, uh, this little guy okay. here. This Jeff, I'm not, not. Your, I'm not seeing your screen. Are other people seeing? Yep. It says it's sharing. Yeah, I can yeah. see too. Okay. So you do see it? Um, no, but I'll work on it. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, it's showing up on the preview. Okay, so she had this little subpleural nodule here. So, you know, she has cysts and nodules, you know, Sjogren syndrome, presumed radiologic LIP. And on her follow-up scan, uh, what changed was this guy got a lot bigger here. So, of course, in these patients, we always worry about them developing lymphoma, particularly malt lymphoma. So because this one had grown and everything else was stable, they did a, a CT-guided biopsy of this. Um, but it wasn't lymphoma. It ended up being an amyloidoma. So um, in this case, the protein deposition associated with this, um, this Sjogren syndrome is, is amyloid. So just a run-of-the-mill amyloidoma. And every other nodule was stable, so it, was, it wasn't an amyloidosis. So my companion case is this next one. It's a, it's a woman who was 58 uh, originally. This is her old scan, and she had just a little bit of bronchiectasis here um, and a few cysts. And then jump ahead many, many years, you can see the cystic lung disease dramatically increased. She also now carries a diagnosis of Sjogren syndrome, and there's that bronchiectasis in here. But because this area popped up and didn't go away, uh, there was concern again of potential lymphoma. Now, there was some airway, there's some airway abnormality, so it could be inflammatory. Um, but it, because it didn't go away, they did a biopsy, uh, a transbronchial biopsy. And this is not amyloid and it's not lymphoma. This is actually a plasma cytoma. It's a kappa chain restricted one. Um, but as far as I know, she has no um, systemic myeloma um, at this point. But uh, what this illustrates is that, you know, Sjogren syndrome is associated with lymphoproliferative disorders. Um, including lymphoma, but also plasma cell dyscrasias. And one of, you know, sometimes plasma cells will secrete amyloid um, from various light chain. And in this case, we actually have a plasma cytoma. So uh, growing nodules in these patients always need to be viewed with caution. And sometimes ones like these part solid ones may represent little areas of indolent lymphoma. They also get bronchiectasis. And I don't know if that's related to the autoimmunity or the Sjogren's, the Sika syndrome, something abnormal in the airways. But uh, two cases wow. of radiologic LIP Sjogren syndrome, yeah. some kind of deposition. Just, so, uh, yeah, both on. of those really help. Those really help, like underscore the whole notion that it's protein deposition in these patients right. in the lungs. Right. So, Jeff, in that last case, there was a little nodule in the wall of one of the right upper lobe cysts, <clears throat> and that's that's oh, yeah. a really good that's a really good pattern too for. Both of these, no, you scroll, scroll on down. Yeah, the right region. there. Yeah, right there. Just went by it. This thing. Yeah, right. So that occurs, I've seen that in cases of amyloid. I've also seen that in cases of, of uh, lymphoma in the wall of uh, cyst and LIP. So, yeah, yeah that, 
that little yeah. combination of a nodule in the wall of cyst is uh, striking. Yeah, I mean, and the, the tricky part of these patients is they have, many of them have nodules and sometimes they grow. So we just end up following them until one decides to you know, grow a little bit faster than its friends. So that's a tricky situation. All right, so this, if you remember two weeks ago, Seth showed a case of uh, mediastinal fat necrosis or that area that looked like an old one. And like, as soon as I got off the webinar, the next case in my queue was an ED case. This patient came in with left anterior chest pain. And uh, you can see there's a small pleural effusion on the left. And right here in the mediastinal fat adjacent to the pericardium is a little area of edema surrounding this little bit of fat here. And then you can see there's some stranding all in that adjacent fat. So this is a nice example of mediastinal uh, fat necrosis in its acute setting. Uh, and the patients usually will complain of localized, often pleuritic pain. I suspect in this case, it was maybe more pericardial because uh, it is sitting right on the pericardium there, but it was enough to irritate the pleura to cause an effusion. Um, and so just important to just, to, as, as a cause of chest pain, and avoid a unnecessary expensive workup and self-limited and NSAIDs are usually the treatment of choice. Um, and then Very since nice. we had that nice congenital case, let me show, um, oh no, I gotta show this case because my colleague Mark came across this case. This is a, so this is a, uh, I think guy's like 50 something. He's an avid exerciser, right? Bikes or, or runs about a hundred miles a week. No family history of anything. Lives a clean life, never smoked. Uh, came in with a, a chest pain and uh, his EKG, which I will show here, um, you can see just shows bradycardia. There's no ST segment elevation. Um, and so, and they sent troponins and they were at this point, uh, the troponins were elevated, but they were worried about a dissection. So he had a CT angiogram looking for aortic dissection. Uh, and this was, I don't think this was gated, um, but it was done on one of the faster scanners. And because his heart rate was so low, you can see we got a really nice look at the aortic root and the coronary artery. And if you look at his coronary arteries, um, his left coronary uh, system is pretty good looking. It's, it looks like the, the circ ends in an obtuse marginal, so he's right dominant. If we follow the right coronary down, you'll see in the mid-segment segment right here, there's a sizable plaque and the vessel dilates, uh, but it is patent. And then there's some plaque along that margin. And as we go distally, watch what happens down here. We lose this branch. There's a small branch going towards the inferior wall of the RV, but this sort of branch crossing over towards the PDA is out. Um, so he went to the cath lab and uh, here's the right injection. And you can see right here, <coughs> the rough cut off of this vessel. So you can see the little bit of regularity, but the, the RCA is big. Here's the branch going across, but right in here, there's this occlusion. So that correlates with the CT and eventually they, they were able to get a wire across it um, and get it open a little bit. And they finally uh, put a stent in there and there we go. So, and he was discharged the next day. So a normal EKG um, with a, a pretty sizable vessel occlusion. This troponin was like five, which is pretty high. And a guy who's otherwise only risk factors are being in his fifties and being male. Uh, so and occasionally get lucky and Mark made a great call on this. So there you go. And then I'll show this other one. That's a nice congenital case. Um, actually, I'll save it for next week because it's time. All righty. Well, great cases, guys. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yep. Thank you all. Next time. Bye.